All right, guys, I'm going to go live an hour later. I know it's 10 o'clock. I know it's time to go live, and I'm here to um, address every single question that I can get to about dog trainers and what dog trainers should know. I think this is a very, very important topic, and I've kind of touched on it before, but I really want to dive into it. There's such an abundance of people who want to be dog trainers, and I think that is just fantastic. I think it's such a great career. It's something that I love doing. It's something that I... I'm incredibly passionate about doing it. Something I can't imagine um, not doing, not being a dog trainer. So, the thing I want to really touch on for um, the greater good, let's call it that, is things that I believe every dog trainer must know, they must be aware of, and they must be considerate of. It's important to know these things because. A lot of people, I, I'm seeing this a lot, Larry Crone and I talked about it on our, on our podcast years ago, a year or so ago, I guess what seems like forever ago. Um, and that is, I don't mind people making a lot of money. I mean, I think it's a great idea. I'm, I'm all for it. I make a good living. I think everybody should make a good living in everything they do. What I have an issue with is when people, and I'm seeing this quite a bit, become a six-figure dog trainer. Uh, you know, and I had to talk about this with Rick from uh, IACP, and he said, you know, well, it's important that dog trainers understand the business side of it, and he kind of opened my eyes to an important aspect that I might have overlooked. I've always been good with, you know, accounting and business management and, and handling uh, finances and as well as scheduling and, and having people skills. Some people may not have that. And I don't have a problem when people are going to teach you the business side of dog training because so much, and maybe I should even do a short course on that at some point, um, people are just teaching people how to train dogs. Inherently, that is the most important thing. For example, when you go to medical school, they're not teaching you how to be an internet sensation. I do, for a large part, have a problem with people who are just internet dog trainers. Now, people have said, well, you're just an internet dog trainer, but that's not the truth. There's a lot more. There's a lot more depth to what I do. I became an internet dog trainer relatively by accident. I didn't want to do it. I was training dogs, having a great time. I was working in the shelters with no notoriety. What happened was people were asking me how I do certain things. So I made 10 sessions, 10 videos on some of the basic things I would teach my dog. And that kind of took off. And from there, I noticed I could help a lot more people. But the core of who I was was someone who was really passionate about working with dogs. Trust me, to this day, ask Alan, ask uh, any of my good friends, you know, Stoops, ask uh, my wife. They'll all tell you that I dislike the whole social media aspect of it. I enjoy helping you guys and getting you guys more information about dog training, but I hate this showing off thing, this, you know, one-upsmanship of criticizing people. I, I detest criticizing other people. I'll call people out if there's something really blatantly wrong, but for the most part, if you're training dogs all positive and I'm training dogs balanced, I got no problem with it, but I will call somebody out if they're abusing an animal, and that's a topic I'm going to cover on a whole nother, another t a day. Today, I'm going to hit really hard on a couple things, and then I'm going to give you, all you guys the opportunity to ask questions. Um, hopefully, there's a lot of people in here who are dog trainers. If you have not yet checked out my online course for dog trainers called Shelter Dog Training, it is an incredible course with an immense amount of information. It's probably over 40 hours it'll take you to get through it um, just to understand these different behaviors and drives and breeds and 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 um, and things you should be doing with dogs, teaching and, and all that. And again, it's based solely on the training and behavioral side of dog training, not on the business side. And again, maybe at some point I'll make some kind of a course for people to understand the business side of dog training. But this topic here is what I think people most importantly, I think you can figure out the business. I think you can figure out you make $100, you, you know, spend so much on your advertising, on your equipment, you put so much in your pocket, you pay taxes. I, it can't be that complicated. I mean, I, I have a hard time thinking people can function without knowing some of those basic things. What I want to focus on is the ethical side, the moral side, the responsibility side of dog training. I think that's really, really important 
that you understand that. And coming from me, like I said, I've got no skin in the game. I'll stop training dogs tomorrow and find something else to do. I don't look at this like a business that I, I need. Hang on, Janet's writing me a note. Hang on. She says, type, oh, it says DOF training instead of dog training. I thought I changed that, but I apparently I didn't. So anyway, so it's for DOF training. Um, I'll change it later. Thank you, honey. Um, that's what I'm saying. That's when you have a great wife. She was always looking out for you. Um, I think most of you guys figured it out. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so let, let's start off with this. The first thing, the very, very first thing that people who want to be dog trainers must possess and must be aware of, and it must be their primary point, is they must love dogs. There is nothing more important, even if you're not a good trainer, if you love dogs, if you genuinely have a passion for them and love them, you will do better for them than if you're just going in to make business. If you have a passion for dogs, you love dogs, you want what's best for the dog, you want what's best for the owners, you will find ways of maybe not being the best trainer, but you will refer to other trainers, you refer to other methodologies, you'll educate people, you will know your limitations. And that is a really important thing that I will get into later is your limitations. But I don't like people who say, well, you know, I don't necessarily like dogs, you know, but I know how to train them. You, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can be a good doctor and not genuinely care about people. If you think about the Hippocratic Oath, if, you know, I don't think you can be a good race car driver and not be passionate about cars. Be, loving dogs and caring about the animal should be the number one thing. I don't think I can think of anything more important than that. Um, what I want to focus on is when you train dogs and you do it from a passion. Now, again, dog trainers should charge. They should make money. People don't like anything for free. I've done free sessions. I think I've done, I don't know, maybe two or three free sessions in my life. Every one of them was a disaster. People have always went to another trainer and said, oh, that guy charged like $200 an hour. And they had so much knowledge. And I thought, well, I was charging $250 an hour, but I gave it to you for free. And they couldn't, they couldn't wrap their heads around that. So um, always, always, always charge for your time. And, but be competitive and be fair. You know, if you're starting out, you should have one rate. If you've been doing it for a long time, you shouldn't be afraid to charge what you're worth. Now, when you're starting out, how does a dog trainer get started? I want to kind of piggyback onto this because this is a really important component. When people are starting out, it's hard to just say, okay, now I'm a dog trainer. I hang my shingle out. I'm a dog trainer. And, you know, bring me your dog. How, how do you really start out? And some of the best people, I think, start out by being dog walkers. There may be veterinary tech technicians. They, um, they volunteer at an animal shelter, which is something I'm going to really get into because I think that's such an important, important piece. Um, I'm going to get into that later. Um, but learn. Like, start learning. There's so much resources um, available on YouTube, on uh, social media in general. I mean, YouTube, I think, is the number one thing for information. There's so much bad information as well, but there's good information. Look at it. Study it. Watch it. Go to dog trials. Go to an AKC trial. Go to an IPO trial. Go to a Mondial Ring trial. Go to a, a dock diving trial. Go to an agility trial really learn to observe dogs. The more dogs you observe, the more dog training you observe, the better dog trainer you will eventually become. The more you see it, whether it's good or bad, the more you will be able to make a decision based on what you saw and how to best apply it and how it, how it relates to each individual dog. Um, I always thought that helping your friends with their dogs is a really good idea. I learned when a friend of mine was training his Doberman, he showed me some things. I, he was very, very good, in, in my opinion, at that point. I think now I would probably disagree with a lot of the things he did, but it opened my eyes to something that was new, something that I didn't really understand. I came from a very physical side. I was always a very physical person, very athletic. So movement and, and the dynamics of movement always worked for me. I taught karate to kids, to adults. So I understood teaching things to, to another being and understanding how the learning process work also helped me a lot. But working with dogs, you know, like I said, if you can volunteer at an animal shelter and walk dogs and just have some treats and teach the dog a sit, a down, a come, and start watching dogs' behaviors, that will make you a much, much, much better trainer. Now, I suggest 
for all dog trainers that they have a very good understanding of various different breeds. So if a person is, let's say, for example, an IGP, IPO trainer, or Schutzen trainer, or whatever, and they've worked with German Shepherds, and they're going to become a trainer for pet dogs. And when I talk about dog training here, for the most part, I'm talking about pet dog trainers. Um, you really must have an understanding of pet dogs. If, in other words, I wouldn't tell a pet dog trainer to say, okay, go get a German Shepherd and train the dog to do protection work because you probably don't have the knowledge to get the dog through that. Now, once you have a, a knowledge of one type of dog, one type of training, you've got to take that further and learn the various ones. For pet dogs, you're not going to be dealing with things like somebody's going to deal with in a ring sport, a, a protection sport, IGP, or anything like that. Understanding the various dogs, the various breeds, the various behaviors, the various drives, the ver various um, you know, e e nuances that, that different dogs have, pet dogs have, is critical there's people say you know a, fr a friend of mine said that it, actually it was oscar mora he said people criticize him for being a uh, protection dog trainer and wanting to train pets well oscar's a great trainer oscar is a very very good trainer and he's very good in protection and he's very good with pets so you that's a real stupid statement for somebody to say about somebody like him what I have an issue with is if somebody has only trained those kind of dogs, and I have friends who have trained those kind of dogs. I'm not going to mention their names. They're very good friends and, and people I've trained with for years, but they would have no knowledge on how to work with a pet dog, on how to work with the, the behaviors and the, the things that plague a pet dog because of the way they're bred, the way they're raised, especially if they're mixes, um, their, 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 their shortfalls, their, their shortcomings, um, and their benefits. Right? Th these people are then only familiar with a specific breed, behavior, and drive of dog. And that is it. Right? Once you understand both, if you can find the skill, and it's something I really recommend to trainers, that if you want to be a pet dog trainer, that you should go out and you should train and hopefully even title a sport dog, whether it's a hunting dog, or whether it's a, uh, an obedience dog, an AKC obedience dog, a protection dog, uh, an agility dog, something. You should have some knowledge of working. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, but what I want to continue on here is, the, if you volunteer at a shelter and you work with shelter dogs, sometimes shelter dogs have issues such as fear, aggression, dominance, shutdown. Uh, sometimes they have food reactivity. Sometimes they're very um, overly playful. Maybe sometimes they're overly rambunctious. There's a reason they ended up in the shelter. A lot of people lie and say they're moving, they can't keep the dog. Oftentimes there's a lot more to it. Volunteering at a shelter, working with various dogs will give you an immense, immense amount of knowledge that you can put into training pet dogs. Um, understanding that dogs should be taught a task of something to do. One of the issues I have with a lot of plain pet trainers is they only teach dogs what not to do. Don't pull on a leash. Don't run away. Don't touch that. Don't do this. And they're always like, the, ah, 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 or they're always correcting dogs. And for me, I think it's a very destructive relationship for dogs to have with a human when that human is always correcting them, always saying, don't do that. Don't do this. Hey, stop. Hey, stop pulling. Hey, stop barking. Hey, stop doing this. Um, it's a horrible thing because the first thing I teach a dog to do is what I want them to do, to look at me, to walk next to me, to down, to sit, to do this, to roll over, to touch my hand, to whatever it is. Those skills, for the most part, will only be taught by someone who has a knowledge of what's called a working dog. What you, when you want the dog to do a task, how do I get my dog to go from point A to point B and sit and wait for me for the next command. How do I get my dog to sit there while I walk away, then jump over a jump and come back and lie down? Those are skills that we teach a dog that are proactive skills, that there are things I want the dog to do as opposed to things I don't want the dog to do. That's why I think it's so important um, to give you a better tool to become a dog trainer to learn a sport and when i say sport it can be anything it can be nose work it can be like i said agility it can be obedience akc obedience it can be protection work 
It can be a ring sport. It can be anything you really, really want. But something where you take a dog that's green and you bring him through a series of tasks that you've taught him to do, and that will help the dog build confidence. And as, as a trainer, it gives you the skill to give the dog um, tools that they're going to need. Dogs need to know what to do much more often than they need to know what not to do. They only need to not do a couple things. They need to do a lot, right? So think about that. Um, and and that, that, that to-do thing is so important because so many trainers, again, especially pet dog trainers that I see, are in this what not to do thing. And it's, I think it's destructive. I think it's negative on the dog. I don't think it gets people anywhere. Um, and it leads to a nagging relationship with the dog. Um, a, a super important aspect for all dog trainers to understand is to know your limits. Really know and understand your limits. And there are limits. We all have limits. I remember when I started out training, I, was, I fell into working with dogs that had aggression and, and serious behavioral issues. I didn't take puppies on. I wouldn't deal with puppies because I was very busy dealing with aggression. It's not that I couldn't do it, but I knew my limits. And I had so many of these dogs I was dealing with that I didn't want to deal with these other dogs. Now, some people who deal with serious behavior cases and stuff like that don't have the patience or the tenacity to work with raising a puppy or giving a puppy the, the, the tools it needs. I'll tell you, for the most part, when I see puppies that are well-raised, well-adjusted, well-balanced dogs, like I always go back to Duane Amater, um, they're raised by a woman who is a little bit more permissive than most guys like me would be. Right? I, I tend to be a, a micromanager on the dog. I tend to try to be too, uh, too uh, protective over the dog, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. And for the most part, giving that dog more freedom. And I remember back when I was doing I, IPO in the day, a, f a friend of mine said, you know, I just have this, this, friend, this female friend of mine raise my puppies when they're 10 months old, then I take over. And it keeps the dog from being, having too much pressure from somebody like me. Now, having lived with Janet for the last several years and watching how she actually raised Dwayne, it opened my eyes to a lot of stuff that I learned, right? That I would have disagreed with. I would have said, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. But Janet did it. You know, she had her own way and I respected that. Um, she came to me when there were serious issues, but for the most part, she was so permissive with him. If he made mistakes, she'd go, oh, well, let's try it again. And my thing was, if a dog makes a mistake, oh, correct it. And you learn that sometimes too many corrections early with a dog starts to stunt their confidence, right? So knowing your limits, knowing that, okay, you know what? I can't handle a dog that's a super dominant personality. Like Janet said, she goes, I was, you know, she thought about getting a Malinois years ago. She goes, then I realized that I'm not the person for that dog. She knew her limits, right? If a person gets really, it always has happy, biddable, nice, happy, go lucky dogs. And suddenly they're going to get themselves, you know, a, a Rottweiler or a Doberman or a German Shepherd or something, a really a dominant bred dog. They're going to have a hard time with that dog. So as a trainer, you must know your limits. As a trainer, you must understand that, okay, this person is dealing with a, a, a severely human reactive dog. So I mean, the dog gets up, upset and then turns and starts biting. I, I can't handle that dog. That's not the right picture for me. I'm going to refer that to somebody else because I want to keep everyone safe, including the dog. I want the dog to be safe. I want the people to be safe. And I want the other dogs to be safe. So you need to have a clear picture in your mind as a trainer this is a dog I can handle. This is a dog I can't handle. This is a situation I'm comfortable with. This is a situation I'm not comfortable with. And that could be that you're very good with very dominant dogs, but when you get a really soft dog, a really fearful dog, that might not be the right picture for you. And you should know that, that you should maybe farm that out to somebody else. In other words, I have a lot of friends who are dog trainers. I don't believe in the, the saying that, you know, the only thing two dog trainers can agree on is that every, the third trainer is wrong. I have a lot of friends who are dog trainers. And in fact, I refer them all the time i have you know somebody a friend of mine just thought of you know his name ben he does disc dogs he does like um frisbee dogs he's an amazing an israeli guy um you know oscar moore I, ref I refer him my friend eric i refer him um i mean i have so many different friends that are dog trainers that i and again now with my business 95 percent of the dog calls i get in get farmed out because I only take on one or two things that I can use for the YouTube channel or, or whatever. Um, 
once you know your limits, you'll be a much, much better dog trainer. Um, it's important to have a mentor. It's important to have someone you can bounce ideas off of. In fact, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine who works at the shelter, and we were talking about something, and she started asking me all these questions. And I gave her all this advice about a, a dog that I thought was very, very dangerous. And when she, um, at the end of the conversation, I said something about my friend Lewis, who Lewis and I did Bound Angels University together. And she said, you know, I miss Lewis. I used to be able to bounce things like that off of him all the time. And he was a mentor to so many, including to me. He was a mentor to me, although I was a very competent dog trainer when we met. He had 50 years on me. And not for nothing but time is a valuable asset. Not all dog trainers, by the way, who've been doing it for a long time are better than people who've been doing it for a short amount of time. I know trainers who've been doing it 10 years who are better than trainers who've been doing it for 30 years just because they've adapted better, they've educated themselves more, and they're much smarter in their approach to dog training. But um, having someone that you can go back to, and sometimes that's just a friend, right? Sometimes I'll talk to um, whoever. I'll talk to Oscar. I'll talk to Avi. I'll talk to Stoops. I'll talk to Frank Phillips. I'll talk to these different people who I respect, and I'll ask them a question. Hey, what do you think of this? Hey, what do you think of that? Because that is involving growth, and, and asking questions, and, and doing that, and having this dialogue is really critical, because one thing I really detest in any industry is a is a blowhard attitude, like you know everything better, because you don't. There's nobody who does. The idea of being able to get people to bounce ideas off of, to have a normal conversation with, is imperative. And that's why things like um, canine and sports and, and IACP are such valuable tools. IACP is an amazing, amazing organization that... Um, that you can join, anybody can join. And if you're starting out as a dog trainer, you have a community of people who will help you to learn more, to study more, to educate yourself more, and to work ideas off of and, and, and make friends with other people in the industry. Because other dog trainers are not your competition. They're not your enemy. They're your asset. They're help, people that will help you. There are more than enough clients for all the dog trainers that are out there. I can promise you that. But... You need to have someone who can help you when, you when you hit these hard times, when you hit the wall and you need information. That's where that comes from. Um, I always say that your dog is your best calling card. Your dog is your best calling card. If you're going to be a dog trainer, one thing is your dog should be very well trained. Your dog should know how to do a bunch of stuff. Your dog should be not aggressive to other dogs. Your dog should be well-mannered. Your, your dog should be an ambassador for you. If you're a dog trainer and your dog is not well trained and is out of control and you say, well, you know, he has some issues, but da 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 you've already discredited yourself to me. I want to see a dog trainer whose dog is a star. Now, I, you know, people say to me, well, what, who's your star? And obviously Goofy was my big star. Goofy's 13 years old. I don't take him out anymore. I mean, I took him out the other day. He gets very tired. You know, he's, he's older. He's had health issues. But in his day, Goofy was the star. And Goofy made me proud. I was always proud to take him out and show people what he could do. He would do his healing. He would do his weaving. He would do his go-outs. He would do his barking. He would do his biting. He would do his um, articles. He would do a, a million different things. He could do anything. And that was my best calling card. I would just take Goofy to the park and have him doing some stuff. And people would flock over and say, oh, are you a dog trainer? Are you a dog trainer? Do you have a business card? Because... That's what you want to do. You know, if you're a fitness trainer, don't have a pot belly and, you know, and, 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 and slouch. That's what you should have. You need whatever you do should be, if you're a hairstylist, you should have a good haircut. Um, if you're a clothing designer, you should wear nice clothes or, you know, whatever it is. As a dog trainer, your dog is your calling card. That's imperative. Um, and again, I think it's important that dog trainers have a working knowledge of both sides of the coin. Like right now, you have such a divisive attitude between the positive, purely positive people and the balanced dog training people. Now, the purely positive sounds nice. Like if somebody was going to come to me and I didn't know anything about dog training, and they said, well, you can go to these guys or you can use us. We're purely positive. We're, we're purely positive with your dog. Well, 
I would probably think, wow, I, I want purely positive. So I now must be able to educate a person who is going to hire me that purely positive doesn't exist, whether you're a purely positive trainer or a balanced trainer. Both trainers will use rewards in training, right? I can say I'm a reward-based trainer because I am. Good behavior gets you a reward. I don't call myself a correction trainer. I mean, bottom line is I call myself a dog trainer. Putting a label on it, it's like when people say I'm a professional photographer, then I worry, right? You're either a photographer or you're not a photographer. There's no professional doctors. There's no professional lawyers. It doesn't exist. You either are that or you're not that. You're not a professional baker. You're a baker. If I go to the store, the bakery, and I say, Is there, who's the professional baker here? There's no professional baker. There's a baker. So educate yourself on both sides. You need to know that some dogs you will train, you will use 98% purely positive methodologies. And some dogs, you will use 50% purely positive. There are no dogs that you will ever train that will be trained purely with force. When I see that, and I have seen it, I've seen a lot of abuse in my days. Now, it's going to be a topic for another video. But when I see people cranking on dogs, abusing dogs, not using rewards, not using praise, anything like that, I have an issue. I think they're horrible dog trainers. I think they're terrible people. And I don't think they should be training dogs because as a dog trainer, I advocate for the dogs. That's critical. I advocate for dogs because dogs are my number one concern. As a dog trainer, I have an undying love for dogs. I have an undying respect for them. And I have a passion. I have a passion for dogs and what's best for them, which is why I became a dog trainer. I never wanted to be a dog trainer. My vet, Dr. Lisa, made me become a dog trainer. She just started having people call me and I couldn't say no. So I started training dogs. It became a business. I'm extremely grateful to her for pointing me in this direction because she, she changed my life more so than most people. She really gave me a direction that changed my life in a way that I never thought it could change. So now as a dog trainer and a, an advocate for dogs, as many of you know with, with Bound Angels, the organization that I founded years ago, I advocated for dogs. And it says, if I see somebody abusing a dog, doing something that is unethical to a dog, I will step in. I will step in. Nobody abuses a dog in front of me. It doesn't happen. If I'm there, it's going to stop. Now, some people can't do that. And I encourage people that when that happens, if you see something that's unfair to the dog, to make a note of it. Now, I'm not saying play the police and, and, you know, turn in your neighbor. Abuse is something that's totally different, right? Correcting a dog is one thing. I've corrected dogs. People say, oh, he's abusing the dog. No, I'm correcting the dog. There are those people who are on, on that one side who can't decipher the difference, right? They can't understand that I might tell my child, no, you can't have 17 boxes of cereal, even though they're screaming and crying in the, in the grocery store. And I'm going to tell my dog, if my dog lunges at another dog, I'm going to correct him at the end of the leash and say, don't do that. Now, that is my spiel on what dog trainers should know. That's a half hour worth of information on what dog trainers need to know, what they should know, what they must know in order to be a, a good dog trainer. Now, I'm going to spend the other half hour of today's of class, uh, class, <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm teaching a class, um, of today's live chat answering questions for you guys. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to try to um, find some questions and I hope you guys use question marks. If not, then, um, I, then I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to look through um, really quick. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read them. I don't look like a, a complete uh, fool. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find questions. A lot of you guys are just chatting with yourselves. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Why don't I see questions? I wish you guys used question marks. Um, very nice to see you here, Sherry. By the way, Sherry's doing her, um, Sherry and, and Harold are doing their food, their raw food. Ch follow them and you'll get really good information. If you see that on, on the screen there, that's their YouTube channel. I highly recommend them. Um, 
Let's see. I'm not seeing any questions. Can there be absolutely no questions? Enjoy your videos. Planning on a Kbody. Um, planning a dog training company for service dogs and autistic children and disabled. That's fantastic. I love that. I love it. Okay, so here, look at this. Joe from Cape Town, South Africa. Love it. Love to see you guys tuning in from all over the, the world. Um, um, okay, have you thought of doing a live with Danny Wells? You know, you've asked me that question about 30 times, um, and I haven't because I don't know who he is. I, I, I'm not often to put dog trainers on the podcast with me because it's, it's just not an interesting conversation unless the person is somebody like a Frank Phillips who I enjoy talking to, Nino, I had on from STS Canine. Um, I've had all the dog trainers on that I really find interesting and compelling. I've had Peter Sherk on, um, Florian Knobel on. I've had people who I really look up to. Um, Larry Crone was on. Uh, Oscar Moore has been on. I mean, I've had so many people on um, that usually dog trainers for me is not going to um, be that interesting of a conversation. Okay, now, tell us, unfortunately, as the industry has exploded post-COVID, there are a lot of people entering the training Dog care world just looking for an easy job. Their love of dogs is limited to loving, easily lovable ones. It takes a special kind of love that extends into a love of training um, and good husbandry. Running into this a lot, I, I couldn't I couldn't disagree with you. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. We need to we need to focus on that. Um, let's see. Yeah, what does it need to have to say? This is what I need, Janet, because Janet just cuts through it and gets right to the questions. I'm not a trainer, just love our first Malinois, and by the way, spelled M-A-L-I-N, who's nine months old, so I wanted to take this chance to thank you for your online training set. Um, my pleasure, Anita. Very, very happy that you um, are get benefiting from it. Makes me very, very happy. And like I said, those of you just tuned in, check out my online dog training at robertcabral.com, including my course for dog trainers that has over 40 hours of, of uh, instruction. There's tests, there's, um, there's lectures, there's dog training, there's hands-on stuff. Um, it's completely taught online. You can complete the whole course probably with, I would say, within two, three, four weeks. It's an amazing course, and it also includes a one-year membership to my monthly site, which is a, 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 a different section of the, of the site that gives you um, lessons with every single dog. And by the way, if you haven't checked out my site recently, um, I suggest you do so because we just put a new section on the site that is um, by the breed. So in other words, now I have um, training lessons with a Rottweiler, a, a, an Akita, a Malinois, a Labrador, so many different, and then every time I do more than, let's say two or three sessions with a dog, it's a little mini series. And you could go through that page and find a dog that has similar drives, characteristics, personality, or breed to your dog and learn from them. That's all available at robertcabral.com. And I highly, highly, highly suggest um, you do that. You check that out. Um, all you guys are kind of, it's funny how immature people are. I, I, I said DOF, D-O-F training because I made it, I, I mistyped it. The F and the G are next to each other on the keyboard. Janet made me aware of that, as you can see right there. Um, and then everybody else keeps chiming in. It's funny. I don't mind. Um, let's see here. Okay, Remington, okay, you're kind of helping me get a better connection. That, and that's really my goal is to get you guys better connected with your dog. I wish you guys had question marks. Um, well, that's a very good thing there, Joe. You really want to keep dogs out of shelters. I think that's critical. Tyler, the mindset of talking about, I think I really resolve clients. It's kind of long. I don't think you have a question there. It really goes on and on. Um, knowing limits is difficult, Michael says. I had a pit bull for 15 years. She was amazing, but you never know the energy or temperament of the next dog. And this is why mentoring or being in a shelter and learning these things and seeing these things. Like when you get to working with a client, the first thing you should do is watch, right? Observe the client with that dog. The worst thing I see is when I see a dog trainer meet a client at the park or get to the client's house and boom, they grab the dog's leash, right? They're immediately showing this is the way you should do it. Well, it's, it, maybe it's not, though, right? Maybe you need to observe because a huge mistake people, dog trainers, make is they show the client, and this should have been in my, my, in my initial spiel, they show the client how to do it. Or they should, I should say, they show the client how they're doing it. What you need to understand is the client is oftentimes not capable of doing what you're doing. That's why they're seeing you. 
So if you have a dog that's aggressive and you grab the leash and say, oh, look, correct him like this. Don't let him do that. Da, 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 da. Well, if they were capable of that, they would have never called you as a dog trainer. You must be compassionate to the person who's hiring you because they may not understand it. Let them do it. Watch what they're doing. Look at their weaknesses. Find out where they're making their mistakes. And then you can help them learn what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. That's going to be a, make a big, big, big difference. Um, but that's very true. But you know what? The other thing here, Jessica, you know you find your best mentor when they make you feel like you're capable of doing anything. There's a problem in that, right? Your mentor should make you feel like you're capable of doing anything, but should also make you aware of your limitations. Because when they don't, they're setting you up for failure. And this is a positive-only world that kids are being raised in, that animals are being raised in, that's destroying the world in a lot of ways. I'm not saying I'm not a gloom and doom guy, but I will say to you that unless you understand the path of failure, the path of success will be very obscured. You must understand failure. It's huge. And it's important that you really you know, understand that. I have a small group of professional dog trainers we consult with. That's fantastic, and more and people need to do that. Um, okay, Philip, I'm in law enforcement. I've never seen a working dog that was trained purely positive. Well, you're absolutely correct. They aren't. There's always a balance. And then, again, I agree with you there. You're, you're making your agreeing with me, so I have to agree with you. Um, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish you guys had questions. I'm not. Oh, here's a question. Finally, Amanda, D why does training, bonding, exercising, etc., build confidence? I know it works, but why does this work? Just took in an abandoned one-year-old um, GF. Uh, she's got great temper and willingness. Well, here's the thing. And this goes back to what the person said about the mentor. When you make your dog aware that they can do things, that builds confidence. In other words, if, if I'm your mentor and I say, look, you can do this, go out there, you've got those skills, you can handle that dog, go do it. You're going to go out there and do it. Now, if I say to you, mm, I don't know, uh, mm, I'm not sure, that's the same message you're giving to this, other, to this dog. So if I take a dog and I teach him how to sit and I teach him how to down, I teach him how to do this, and then every time they do it, I go, yeah, you did it, yeah, you did it, you're reinforcing a skill the dog has, and it makes them feel that they're doing something right. We all get confidence. We all become stronger when we're doing good. In other words, if I take and I put 200 pounds on the, on the bench press and I bench it, I feel good. If I put 350 pounds on and it gets crushed on my chest and I need two people to pull it off, I feel like a failure, right? I will grow more from being able to push the 200 pounds off my chest than from being stuck under the 300 pounds. It's as simple as that. Confidence builds confidence. Being able to do something builds confidence. Um, I don't know what, Tar Hills, if you have a question, you got to put it back because I've already scrolled way down. Um, please type it again. I'll, I'll get to it. Um, okay, so here, you're in the Netherlands. You can't use my dog training tools. It's forbidden. First of all, I don't have dog training tools. I use e-collars. I use prong collars. But I think if you were to go through my website, Go, go, go to robertcabral.com. There's a hundred and, I mean, I don't, know, I, I don't know. There's 170 lessons. I don't know, something like that. I would bet you that more than 80% are just on a leash. And leashes are legal everywhere still. Right? That, that's simple as that. So um, my tools are, are legal everywhere. In fact, I worked over 10 years at the city shelters here in LA. And I never used anything but a slip lead. I never used anything but a slip lead on any of those dogs because of animal rights people would, would, would have my head. So um, what exercise to do for impulse control with high prey drive dogs, malpitch, armature? Well, impulse control is really based on, you don't want to squash impulse control. You want to teach the dog to do something. So I always redirect. When a dog has reactivity issues, I don't tell the dog to sit. I don't like trainers who get a dog that's super hyped up and then they t tell the dog, sit down, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to take, um, you know, a, a boiling pot of water and put their hand over it so that it doesn't make steam. It's, it's just going to explode somewhere. So um, pre 
prey drive is always best redirected to another behavior, which can be um, walking and following you, making turns, or whatever, whatever you want to look at like that. You don't take a dog that has a high degree of prey drive and tell them to stop, sit, down, quiet, or anything like that, because they're not capable of it. Until that dog learns what you want and how to direct... You're leaving? You're leaving early. 20 minutes early. You said you're leaving at 11. There goes my wife. She's leaving. Okay. Love you, honey. Bye. Um, until you can do that, then you don't understand that drive, right? If you're trying to shut it down, it's not going to happen. You need to redirect it. Once it's redirected, then the dog learns to channel it. Then you can shut it down. It's a fantastic question. Yeah, people, guys, don't forget to hit the like button. There's 200 people in here. Um, hit it on your way out because you need to leave the chat and go in and hit the like button. Do that. If you're, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram uh, or uh, YouTube, the, the chat is live on both. I can see that. Um, be sure you be sure you like the the, uh, the chat, the live, <laughs> and um, also be sure you um, subscribe to the channel, like my Facebook page, follow my Facebook page, follow me on YouTube, um, and if you want, check out my website robertcabral.com because there's a lot more there. Um, we can only use food, no correction on leashes. Um, well, you're in the Netherlands and you can't use... I, I, I have a hard time believing that, right? Because if your government has gone so crazy um, that well, you're not allowed to correct a dog, you're, you're living in a really dangerous society. Guys, this is why I'm always talking about balance training and allowing tools to say, stay legal. There's constant pushes and I'm going to tell you, I've seen, these last couple of weeks, I've seen some really bad abuse videos. People send them to me. And feel free to send them to me because I collect them and I, I've got a plan for them. I can tell you of the abuse videos that I've seen in the last 10 years, an overwhelming majority, an incredible majority of those videos, never once involved an e-collar. I've seen abuse on an e-collar. And this is why I'm against banning the e-collar. Listen to this for a second. I'll get into this in another video. If you see abuse, and let's say out of 100 cases, 25% of those cases are abusing a dog with an e-collar, and the only focus of that conversation becomes we should ban the e-collar, then you are ignoring 75% of the abuse that exists in the world. And I can tell you, I saw some statistics from the Los Angeles city shelter system of over 50,000 cases of abuse, maybe even more. I don't know what it was. I think it was at least 50,000 cases, not one involved, in, maybe one involved in e -call. I don't even know what it was. But nothing significant. It wasn't, it wasn't even a blip on the radar. So we need to focus on abuse wherever you live in the world. If people are abusing animals, they should be called out for it and they should be punished criminally punished but limiting it because the one person who used the e-collar now we're going to ban the e-collar is as narrow-minded as anything can possibly be so your government is very narrow-minded in the netherlands i hate to tell you that they're narrow-minded in germany they're narrow-minded in switzerland because i'm going to tell you i can promise you that in all these countries where e-collars, prong collars, all this stuff is banned, they're still using them. You mean to tell me because cocaine is illegal in the United States, nobody does cocaine? Are you completely insane? You know, as a trainer and as a dog lover, fight for that. Okay, you have a three-month-old American Staffordshire, Connie Shea. Since I got her, she's been sleeping in a bed. Now I got a crate and she's accustomed to... To est. I don't know what est means. I don't really know what your question is. Um, I, I don't I put the bed in the crate. I mean, you're a three month old dog. It's not a big deal. Put the dog in a crate. It's just make, that's the new policy. Put the dog in the crate. The dog will love the crate. Put a little crate pad in there. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Don't over, you know, don't overdo it with the dog. Okay, here, Tar Heel. How can I adopt a Belgian Malinois? Well, that's a really simple question. Look at, there's, there's tons of uh, Malinois uh, rescue groups. There is the Malinois, uh, I think there's the one called the Malinois Rescue League. There is, um, just go, 
just Google Malinois Rescue. That's exactly what I would do. And you'll find one. Or go to a shelter and find one. Shelters, every shelter has at least one. I can promise you that now. With all these morons backyard breeding, ruining the breed, breeding the crappy dogs, you'll still find a good one in a shelter. You know, Malinois is probably one of the only dogs that you can go into a shelter, rescue one, and possibly title it still. It's not going to happen with most other dogs. You can do it with a Malinois. Have you any experience with idiopathic sudden rate syndrome in dogs? Yes, I have. And I'll tell you, a lot of times it's misdiagnosed. The, it, for it to be idiopathic sudden rage syndrome, it, 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 it's a sudden rage, right? It's an uncontrollable rage. When you see a dog get aggressive, um, the, the idiopathic sudden rage syndrome is really an uncontrollable rage. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very rare, but it's very dangerous. When you look at a dog that has severe dog reactivity without this case, it can often be the same. So the first thing I always tell people, if a dog is suddenly acting aggressive, suddenly doing anything, not eating, eating too much, peeing too much, whatever, see a vet. Your first step should always be a veterinary visit and diagnose. But I can tell you, for the most part, it's over It's overused, the term. It's, oh, this dog has this, da, 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 especially in shelters. Oh, he's really aggressive. He's got idiopathic sudden rage syndrome. Get your dog looked at by a vet, especially if it's something that suddenly comes on, right? There's often dogs who have brain issues, like a swelling of the brain. They'll, they'll have aggression issues. If you see that, get the dog checked. If not, deal with it from a behavior standpoint. Um, wants to play a tug of war with her leash. Is there anything? I, do? I already have videos on that. I'm trying to really just address here um, that I'm trying to just address dog training questions here. So if I can, it would be a lot easier for me because there's a lot of, here's a question here. Um, do you find we treat dogs for too long after they have mastered an exercise? When should you ease off the treats? Okay, so I don't, right? I don't think we treat dogs too long. Um, I think we lure dogs too long. I think we need to continue. A dog should constantly be rewarded for good behavior. I do think we stop rewarding dogs too soon, and then they stop doing what they're doing. The, the rewards can be faded. We, I call it fading it to another behavior, like fade, chain two or three things behavior uh, together and then rewarding. But cutting the reward is super dangerous, right? It's super dangerous because once the dog stops seeing a reward for it, they'll stop doing it. And that's anything. That's any creature, right? If the reward isn't there, then why would I keep doing it? Right? So it must be there but the lure must be faded sooner. So that's a good question. I hope I um, made that clear to you. Timothy says, I need a recap on redirecting an eight-month-old with nipping and biting. I just received, rescued him. And I said, well, look at some of my videos on that. I talk a lot, a lot about that. I want to kind of get to questions about dog training. Um, how to prove dog focus when entering a new environment. Well, it's, again, you have to have the focus before the dog um, before you expect it. In other words, I have to treat, t teach the dog through luring and shaping early on, and then I can um, bring the dog into environments slowly. Some, and it's, it's some of this, a lot of it is nerve issues, so I don't really have um, the ability to change a dog's overall genetics. That's really, really important. Um, Laura says, have you thought of creating a dog trainer school? Your my inspiration would love to learn directly from you. You know, I wouldn't do a school because... I, I, I did the school at the Bound Angels University for shelters, but it's, I'm limited to 10 people or 15 people. And, uh, you know, I've made, because of my audience being so large at this point, um, I've decided to do it online. Now, there are some things coming on my site that will definitely um, help you with this question you have and, and, and your situation. I promise you that. So um, I hope you remember my site because that will give you a lot more information. Okay, D says... Um, how do you address pet training when people don't follow up? How do you encourage them to utilize your methods at home? What do you do when they don't follow up? Stop working with them. Yeah, that's a very good question, D. I am very, very, um, I'm a strong personality. I, I say exactly what I feel. Like I tell them, look, I can help you with your dog. And I've, I've taken clients, you've seen it on my videos. They'll do one session, the dog is transforming. The second session, the dog is getting much better. And then they think it's, you know, they think I changed the spark plug in the dog, which is an idiotic approach to behavior, any kind of training. 
right? It's the same people who hire, I use this analogy all the time. It's the same people who hire a fitness trainer for three months to get in shape and then they go back to eating pizza and not going to the gym. It's the same stupidity. You must tell people that what I'm here to do is not to train your dog, but to show you what your dog needs and to demonstrate how it will work. That's what I do, right? I, I show people what their dog needs. I demonstrate how well it will work. And then I say, now, from today on, this is exactly what this dog needs. It cannot see another picture ever again. It cannot see the old picture again. People who listen to that will have immense success, but you will never have 100% success. You'll never have it. You'll never have every single person listen to you because a certain percentage of people are dense. <coughs> Excuse me. A certain uh, percentage of population is just ignorant. They just can't figure it out. They just will not listen. And that's that. So, um, okay, what advice would you help uh, to grow that easy love of dogs into a more complete kind simple because love um with with dogs is not love dogs see love through structure right that means if they if you make them do what you want them to do and you can guide them on a walk and guide them in an exercise and guide them in life they will love you because that's how they equate love through safety they feel safe they feel confident they love if a dog, you know, you see it all the time. I'll give you a great example. You ever see a person who's coddling a little dog and the, uh, the, the, they're, they're loving the person, they're kissing, licking, and they're, they're so happy, and somebody comes up to go give that person a hug or something, and the dog rah, 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 comes out? That dog feels immense love for that person, but a complete conflict in dealing with the day-to-day -day life of, you know, just experience of life of other people. That's a perfect example of it. The dog should be confident enough to know that, oh, this other person's coming. Maybe they're going to give me more love, right? You teach love to a dog through structure. The dog must respect you. The dog must listen to you. And then that dog most all the time will love you. Um, and, but it must be done fair. Have you ever thought about traveling, going to animal shelters, rescues outside of your state? Um, I have. I have thought of that, and uh, it's still a thought. And in other words, I, I'm still thinking at some point. And right now, I'm not doing any traveling, I'll be honest with you. I'll be at the IACP in September, um, but that will be a very, very last-minute trip. For, so if you're going to the conference, you'll see me there for Monday and Tuesday, and I'm flying in on Sunday, out on probably Tuesday night or Wednesday because I have three 13-year-old dogs that I'm taking care of. So my wife, I'm, I'm praying that um, she will be you know, able to handle everything, which I, she always does. But um, I'm not traveling there. But yeah, in the future, I will start. Um, what my plan was to do two seminars a year, one for dog training and one for uh, shelters, because shelters are very, very close to my heart. I'm starting a new program with shelters here that I'll make announce. I'll, I'll, I'll announce very soon. Okay, Claudio says, my 15-month-old German Shepherd is still play biting when petting him or when he wants attention. How can I stop this behavior? Greetings. Thank you. The way you stop that is by teaching him to stop, right? In other words, what I do is if a dog starts play biting, I put my hand in his mouth. And I say, knock it off. In other words, I don't pull the hand away. I don't smack the dog onto anything. They put my hand. They put their mouth on my hand. I push into their mouth and I say, knock it off. I'm very calm, very direct about it, and that's it. And the dog usually will figure that out. And you don't. You don't want a conflict with your dog. You want the dog to understand that that is an uncomfortable thing. If he did it to his mom, his mom would nail him. His mom would 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 grab him and pull him away or shake him. And um, the thing that happens a lot is you'll start to do a correction, but you won't follow up on it, and then the dog will get stronger. The dog needs to know not to do that. Okay, how do breeders become good breeders? What can they do to make good dogs? Um, I'm not talking about breeders today, but I will just touch on this because it's such an important topic. Um, good breeders breed, they understand the lines of the dogs they're breeding. That's the number, number one thing. They understand the genetics of the lines and they know what they're going for. They may not always get it, but they know what they want. Hobby breeders, uh, backyard breeders, they just kind of breed. That's a pretty dog. That's a pretty dog. Let's put them together. Good breeders do health checks and DNA testing on dogs. They, they know what the likely outcomes are. There's a lot of technical, technical terms, but they really approach it from a, I would even say scientific side where they know exactly what they're going for. They're breeding dogs they know, two dogs they know. They will take dogs back when it doesn't work out. They'll, they'll stand behind their dogs. They will health test their dogs. They will uh, microchip their dogs. They will 
always be there to take the dogs back and talk to you and help you through things like that. That's the rarest exceptions. Um, at this point, I'm only looking for question marks, only question marks. Um, so if you don't have a question mark, I'm not going to get to it. I'm sorry. Okay, Sheeran. See, notice the first part is a question mark. How would you recommend it as mentor in or close? Or who would you recommend as a mentor in or close to Switzerland? Um, if I was in Switzerland, I would go north to um, Hoywinkel. The, 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 the Hoywinkel. Now, by the way, there's a woman who just won the WSV, and she's a, a German Shepherd um, Club uh, event, and um, she's from Switzerland. So that's obviously saying something, but I, you know, I'm a big fan of Hoywinkel in Germany. I would ask them, and I'm sure they would have some advice to you. That, that's very close to you, to Switzerland, because they're in southern Germany. Um, I have I issues with leash reactivity. Um, okay, I'm going to put this up here because it's important. It's a little free, free advertising. The shelter dog training course and all online content are second to none, highly recommended. And that's coming from a professional dog trainer, VIP canine. So thank you for that. Very, very much appreciate it. I mean, that's all available on my website at robertcabral.com. Donna says, I've been training for about three years now. Sometimes I think I'm trying to cover too much with a client. What would you say the most important things to cover with a client are? Okay, so I'll tell you, that's a great question. First of all, the first thing is... Um, there's three things you should make it your goal that the client and the dog can do. One, come when called, leave it, and stay. That's it. Once those three things are covered, that's the first. Once those are covered, I move on. I don't care about loose leash walking. I don't care about, unless it's, it's just a serious issue. But those are important. The dog must come when called. The dog must stay when told. The dog must leave it. Then you start working on loose leash walking. That would be my fourth thing I would cover. And I wouldn't get into too much behavior things. I mean, you're probably a dog nerd like me, and you like to talk a lot about dogs, but most clients, they don't. They, it's way too far over their head, so don't push them on it. Um, okay, Maritza says, I'm a member. Would you ever come to Toronto for a seminar? I, I, I will. In the future, I will promise you I would be doing more seminars. Yes. Um, is it possible to be a trainer with only online courses? I don't understand that question. Are you saying, could you become a trainer by only doing online courses? And the truth to that matter is you need hands-on experience. The online courses, whether it's mine or a host of other good ones, they will give you the knowledge. They will give you the, the experience, the mental and educational experience you need. You must go train dogs. You must go volunteer to shelter. You must work with somebody. You must train your dog. You must do these things because you can't just take a course and hang a shingle out and do it. And I don't care if it's my course or anybody's course. Um, but without them, I think you're even more limited because you can't learn the things you need to know to be a trainer. It's, it's, it's really important. So that's a very, very fantastic question. Um, I'm going to look for one more question. Um, let's see. Okay, this one. Prince and I. Can you use an e-collar for reactivity? Okay, I don't want to get into e-collar things. I'm, I'm trying to go, go on dog trainer stuff, so I'm going to look for one more. Um, okay, I, I saw this Ohio. Uh, I saw that already. I'm only talking about, I'm going to look for one more. <laughs> um, nope, it's got to be about dog trainers. Okay, I'll, I'll give you this one. Mr. Per, per love, whatever it is. I guess it's Puerto Rico love. Say see your hat. I currently have a two-year-old Roddy. He has been attacked two times by loose dogs running in the streets. Now he's reactive to other dogs while walking. How do I correct? It's going to be nearly impossible. I, to tell you the truth, once a dog has been attacked by off-leash dogs and you live in an area where there's off-leash dogs, the dog will forever think that those dogs are coming to attack him. You, you need to get the dog to experience something positive. That's really, really um, important for, for the dog to understand. The dog must understand safety, trust to be able to do that. I'll do this as the last question. Um, Michael says, are some dogs more motivated by play than food? My mama seems to be one of these dogs. So some trainers will tell you only to train with food, and some trainers will tell you only to train with toys. And I will tell you that there's no right or wrong, right? You, I start with food always, because food is a, is, is a high value item, but it's lower drive than toys. 
You can repeat things more often with food. Um, your dog should be hungry. I mean, I don't know any Malinois that won't work for food. They all love food, um, unless you're overfeeding your dog. Um, but toys, it, jumping in with toys too soon, you won't get the finesse that you'll get with food because you'll get the drive elevated too fast, and then the dog won't be able to respond in a structured or, or cohesive manner. You must be able to use both tools, right? The luring of food, the luring with toys, the reward with food, the reward with toys, which is later then shifted to a reward with praise and a toy later. Guys, um, I hate to do this to you, but it's 11 o'clock. I have a member live. Now, if you're a member of my site at robertcabral.com, the next live will be in about two minutes. I'm just going to use the restroom. I'm going to take a break and sit up. My back has been killing me. It's been out for two weeks. But um, I want to thank you so much for being here, for continuing to follow my work, to spreading the message of my work. There's so many of you here. God bless all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I apologize if I did not get to answering your question. I really do. There's just, with 200 people, it's highly unlikely I get to every question. Um, you, if you have a question, you can always, if you're a member of the site, um, submit it via the form, and it will be answered there. Every question is answered for my members. Um, if you're out here, I do my best. And again, if you want to submit it on, uh, on the videos, I will promise to try to get it on and ask me anything. God bless all of you guys. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for your continued support in making dog training um, really kind and, and beneficial for dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.